thank you very much, Tio. Yeah. So what I will do, I'll try to explain what all these words and names mean. Although some names mean no, they don't need any explanation anyway, but still. So usually when I remember once Gelfand gave an advice. He was saying that if you are giving a talk to mathematicians, you use physics language. If you are giving a talk to physicists, you use math language. <laughs> yeah. Since they're on, but so we'll kind of use the mixed one. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'd like just usually after every colloquium talk, there is just one sentence everybody needs to take home if. And this sentence is very simple. So it will be a slogan. So I will say very naively, very primitive slogan, but supersymmetry is equivalent to Hamon. So if you know this much, that's very good. So that's take home. Of course, when supersymmetry was invented, people have no idea what these words mean. And supersymmetry means some physics concept, which is not realized. But and it's uh, for particles, which are quantum. We will be discussing kind of its classical counterpart, which means precisely this. So let me start with example, which will explain everything. Then we'll build more exam other example on it, and so on. So let's start with example. So suppose we are given compact symplectic manifold. M with symplectic form on it. Yeah? And suppose there is a circle action. S1 action. And this action, suppose this action is Hamiltonian. Then this means that there is a vector field generated by this action. And Hamiltonian means if you take symplectic form, if you consider contraction with this vector field, which is a one form, this one form is exact, dh, where h is a Hamiltonian function. That means that we have a Hamiltonian action on a compact symplectic manifold. Then. Suppose also for simplicity that V has isolated zeros. Or in other words, this action has isolated fixed points. Has, isol has isolated zeros. Then there is the following simple fact. It goes back to Dustermatt. Dustermatt. Heckman. Namely, this fact is consider the following integral of the function negative h over so. We have a Hamiltonian function. Consider this function on a manifold and take this volume form. It's called Liouville volume form, symplectic volume form. Then this Dustrem and Hetman theorem says that this integral localizes to the set of fixed points. Fixed points. And there is such a, this exact formula, m1 of p, m2 
Suppose it's two n dimensional. And then we have this exact formula, which says that this integral can be evaluated as a finite sum sum over fixed points. You take the value of the function, divide by corresponding power of parameter t. You can just rescale if you like. And these are the integers for each. At each fixed point, the action is rotation by some multiple. These are some integers, because it's rotation in each plane. You can always choose system of coordinates. That's a remarkable formula, looks at the first sight, because it says that this is a calculus integral, effectively. We can make it two-dimensional, if you like. And then any integral of this type can be computed using Laplace method when t is large. When t is large, this is exactly the leading term in the asymptotic formula you obtain. This goes for one-dimensional integral, for multi-dimensional integral. This is known as Laplace method or stationary phase approximation. We can take t pure imaginary. Say. Any complex number will do. And this says that the formula that the Laplace or saddle point approximation is exact. So, and it looks like a miracle. But of course, this happens very rarely. Because what it means that we have a Hamiltonian action it means that this vector field has all its integral curves are all closed, all points, which is, happens very rarely. So this is a very special phenomenon. And this is not a calculus formula, but rather this is a cohomological formula, as we'll see in a second. So this is a very useful fact. Then Atia and Bot. and both generalize it to a full extent. We'll not discuss this. But this is the building block, the main building block. So, so in the case where the fixed points aren't isolated. Yes. The if points the fixed points are not isolated, this can be generalized. Atiyah and Bot, Berlin Verne, and many other people. There was a huge literature in the 80s, Berlin Verne and other people. So there is a book which explains by Berlin and Verne. So the proof is essentially one line. You rewrite this integrand as the following differential form. Just multiply by t to the n this side. And you write it negative th plus omega. Right. That's exponent of a differential form. And then the statement is that this form, it's of mixed degree, degree 0 and, and 2, is equivalently closed. The exponential is, interp is interpreted as a power series. Yes, of course. It's interpreted as a power series. That's why you get 1 over n factorial. And this is called Liouville measure in statistical mechanics. Because symplectic manifold carries canonical volume form or measure. It's a Liouville measure. So equivalently closed. What does this mean? It means that you consider equivalent differential d. Well, there are many models of equivalent cohomology. You use, I think, Cartan model, where this equivalent differential is very simple. It's just d, little d, the ram plus contraction. So d square squares to Lie derivative with respect to vector field v. And then the easy fact is that d of h plus omega is 0. It's a manifestation of Hamiltonian action. By using this form, we see that this form, h plus omega, is equivalently closed. 
But then another simple fact is that every equivalently closed form outside the zero locus of a vector field is equivalently exact. And moreover, its top component is exact everywhere outside the zero locus. So you imagine you compute this by cutting small balls around fixed points and using Stokes theory and doing some simple careful analysis. So that's the proof. So the key fact is that every equivariantly closed form is enclosed, therefore is equivalently exact on M outside the zero locus of your vector field. If the zero locus is a collection of sub-varieties, you do localizations in a slightly more complicated way. But that's all very simple. This capital D doesn't give you a complex if you're using the ordinary differential forms, but if you take the ones that are invariant. Right, if you use a invariant differential forms, that's exactly the complex. And, and of course, this is a consequence of another very simple fact, which says, so, Suppose you have equivalently closed differential form on a manifold. Then this integral, so you have one equivalently closed form, and beta is one form, one form on the manifold, S1 in V. then this integral does not depend on t. It's another very simple. How you prove it, you differentiate and use Stokes theory. That's very basic fact. But that's a very powerful method of computing integrals. You put t equals 0. This is integral over a. And then you may. If you are lucky, if your choice of beta is good enough, you may send t to infinity. And then this can be evaluated by some easy, in some easy way. So that's the, what lies beneath this. So that's a funny dimensional example. What does it do with this? Because our, and what do we mean by what this words mean. Supersymmetry is equivalent cohomology. It's very simple. If you take local coordinates on a manifold, say x mu, then d of x mu would be dx mu, right? Local differential form. If you take d of dx mu, you get component of your vector field, v mu of x. So it sends coordinates to one forms, one forms to functions. So this D mixes commuting and anti-commuting variables. That's exactly what the supersymmetry transformation is. So this explains this part. Now, this, there is another way how one can think, and this way will be crucial, how one can think of integrals of differential forms over manifold. The idea is <laughs> very basic. You use, instead of integrating differential manifolds over a manifold, we integrate functions on a super manifold. There is a one very nice construction which almost tautological, but which admits a nice generalization to the, to the other examples we'll discuss. So the, the fact, another fact is, consider the tangent bundle to your manifold. And then change the parity in the fibers. Capital P stands instead, so what it means, the tangent planes are form a commutative algebra, replace it by skew commutative. In other words, replace 
usual commuting coordinates by skew commuting. Then any differential form, which can be written like this, can be thought as a fun if you replace this by denote this by Grassmann variables. In other words, you, you consider at each point you consider a Grassmann algebra, which is algebra generated by modular relations. It's a Grassmann algebra, or it's a form of exterior algebra in code. So replacing by this, we can assign to a differential form a function on a supermanifold. This is called supermanifold. This terminology is not, it's not nice, but it's kind of came after supersymmetry. But this is a completely rigorous concept. You just you, you think of a supermanifold as a ringed space. And instead of commutative rings, you use graded commutative rings. It's very basic, and this can be described as even you can talk about schemes in this way. You can talk about super schemes. So this is a, then you. Uh, in, the, in, in your lemma, alpha is not assumed necessarily to be a top form. It no, a just top a component. A, and the integral just reads off the top form. Right, exactly. These are forms, all forms here are of mixed degree, like this one. So that's the kind of a mm -hmm. example. And so then what we think? We think of a differential form as a function on tangent bundle with reverse parity in the fibers. Theta are, com are co these are local coordinates in on the manifold. These are local coordinates in the fibers with reversed parity. And then, in order to rewrite this integral and as an integral of a function on a supermanifold, we use a key observation that this supermanifold has a canonical volume form, which is used. Canonical volume form would be this means ordinary differential. Here you use what is called Berezin integral or integral over Grassmann variables. That's a key concept. But there is a notion of integration Let's put over. Grassmann variables. One S Grassmann variables. What does this mean? The rules are very simple. Basically, the, you write every every element here. You write as a linear combination of homogeneous components, then the Grassmann integral picks up coefficient at the top component. That's all. Formally, you, you write it like this. Integral of d theta is 0. Integral theta d theta is 1. And you can write integral theta 1. Well, I'm writing this theta n in this particular order. Is n. If one of the thetas is missing, the integral is 0. It's like, so this is kind of uh, algebraization of integration of differential forms. And then we can write almost tautologically that integral of alpha over a manifold is the integral of a function on a supermanifold 
P of a tangent bundle with respect to canonical measure. Why I'm writing simply dx d theta, meaning the product. Why it's canonical? Because by the rules of Bayesian integration, linear change of variables brings Jacobian downstairs. Linear change of variables or any other change of variables gives you Jacobian of the change of variable in the denominator, and they, and they cancel. Therefore, this is invariant expression. That's the volume form on a supermanifold. And so this is just a way of writing. So for there is no gain, no loss in this form. But this, we'll see the advantage of this immediately once we consider the, the following example. So this is what we need to know about finite dimensional example. When we have a manifold, here when we have a group, Hamiltonian action of a group, say of a circle, we have a localization. This is called localization. And this is another way of expressing just calculus. This is calculus. Now let's consider more interesting thing. So this was the first example. Now let's consider the second example. I will delete this lemma. Second example, we replace the manifold by the free loop space. We replace M by free loop space. It's infinite dimensional, and so we don't know what it means. You can develop. Now, Call correctly, even in the finite dimensional case, if you're trying to do a Berezinian integral where the, the body, the even manifold is not compact, you have to worry about boundary terms. Yes, okay. sure, right, right, absolutely. But here, for simplicity, all manifolds are compact, yes, so the base now manifold. Be. So right, right, <laughs> so, but who cares, yeah. So you have this free loop space with a natural circle action. There is a natural. Natural S1 action. How we define it, other smooth loops or more complicated, you can define, if you like, if M is Riemannian, you can define a Wiener measure on a loop space, becomes very complicated, or you can do stochastic calculus. All this we ignore. We just formally think of this, and then what we consider, we will consider tangent bundle to a loop space, let me put in parentheses, with reversed parity. This would be our main object, tangent bundle with reverse parity. Now, it's a loop space, therefore, ordinary tangent bundle to a loop is the elements are vector fields along the loop. So you can see the vector fields, and you replace them by Grassmann at each instance of time. You replace them by Grassmann variables. And this can be actually rigorously defined. There is some literature on this. John Lott and other people were discussing this. Jean-Michel Bismuth, many, many people were working this rigorously. For us, it's not that interesting. We will try to see how this, we'll try to see how the supersymmetry appears and why the, the supersymmetry is very powerful in this regard. So here it's, very basic. Now we consider the following example. So remember these formulas for the soup. Now we will consider supersymmetry trans transformation here as you have any x of t, x mu is psi mu of t, and delta psi mu 
of t is negative, well, negative is not important, but let's put it negative, x dot mu of t. Dot stands for the time derivative. So that's the component of a corresponding vector field. That's the supersymmetry transformation. One can say that you can also realize this equivalent action of capital D or the delta as certain, you can introduce certain graded Poisson algebra structure on the whole ring of differential forms. So there should be a, a supersymmetry or invariant cohomology generator. So you can think of this as a bracket of some Q with x mu. And here also it's a bracket of some Q with psi mu. This Poisson bracket is graded, and of course it applies to, to commuting and anti-commuting. Same can be done here. So that's the super, super symmetry. Now, why it's, and then <coughs> why it's useful? Because we would like to consider the following situation. So how this is related to the first Atiyah Zinger. So consider the index of a Dirac operator. Consider a spin bar, the Hilbert space. Consider Z2 graded Hilbert space. Z2 graded. You think of this as some L2, some bosonic Hilbert space, tensor product with some Clifford module, some fermion Hilbert space. The Clifford module is naturally Z2 grading. This two grading splits on the whole Hilbert space. And then in this Hilbert space, all operators can be thought as block two by two operators. So A, A one one, and since we have a grading, we can assign parity plus one to this vector space and minus one to this. And therefore, we can consider a trace of an operator and a graded trace called super trace. And we'll see that the two are very useful. First, let's discuss the super trace. So let's delete this. These are trivialities, in fact. Let's consider what is a, if our operator A is this. And of course, if it's well defined, if these operators on a diagonal are of trace class, of course, then you can define super trace. A, it's a difference of traces. And then, of course, the ordinary trace, if it's a trace class operator in the Hebrew space, is the sum of this individual trace. And the supersymmetry naturally appears when, so, say, consider, of course, M is a spin manifold. So this loop space is orientable. Therefore, and then we can see, we think of M with some Riemannian metric. And then we consider the Dirac operator associated with this Riemannian metric. Is uh, that supposed to be a closed manifold? All manifolds are compact. Yeah, compact means closed. Yeah, we're discussing only this. Then we'll illustrate all this first for Atiyah Zinger on spin. Then we'll do circle. We'll do M will be circle. But even circle will be interesting. For index theory, circle is trivial because but for and doing circle will pass from Atiyah Zinger to Jacobi Poisson. We'll get Poisson summation formula by using supersymmetry. 
and then we'll consider other examples I will mention, of course. But I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. So take a, the spin manifold with the Riemannian metric. There is a Dirac operator. It has taken its component d plus, say. And then we want to just, then we can do the following. We can define operator q, which is, I don't remember what are the signs, but this is of no importance. This is adjoint, adjoint. So d plus maps h plus to h minus. It's adjoint maps h minus to h plus. Q square. Q square is obviously in this order. And then we consider we denote Q square as a supersymmetric Hamiltonian operator. These are just words. It's just Q square. And then we like in Atiyah Zinger set up, we consider, or in physics set up, we consider the evolution operator. In our case, the heat current. We consider evolution operator in Euclidean time. So instead of solving Schrodinger equation, we solve the heat equation. So we consider this. You're, you're also assuming that your manifold M is even dimensional, I think, right? Your spin manifold is even dimensional. Yes, yes. If, yeah, yeah. Sorry. The yeah. Are spin, mm -hmm. Thank you. Then we consider this operator. And there are, which has a block. Here it's adjoint times original operator. Here the order is reversed. And then the easy thing, which is what is called Makin Zinger formula, is that the supertrace of this evolution operator is precisely the index of a Dirac operator. Is beta just a real parameter here? Or? Beta is real parameter positive. And this is Euclidean time. Or in statistical mechanics, beta is inverse temperature. It's proportional to inverse. So beta is very important parameter. This is the index and doesn't depend on beta. So we don't really care what beta is. And then this is analytic index, analytic index. So the super trace gives us analytic index. That's always the case. Now we want to get a different expression for it. Here we observe that quantum H, quantum Hamiltonian, so to say, is supersymmetric because it is kind of a square of capital Q, which is a generator of a supersymmetry. We don't work it out, but this is clear. Then, once this is true, we can write that analytic, what about topological index? And then we have, we use the following observation or that let's consider, say, matrices. Then we have the following statement that the spectral trace, let me write this as another slogan, spectral trace equals to the matrix trace.
say full matrices. What does this mean? Spectral trace is the sum of the eigenvalues of any matrix or operator. Matrix trace is a trace in linear algebra, sum of diagonal elements. Therefore, this is the for traces. Same holds for super traces, interpreted properly. Now, what is a matrix super trace? So, topological index is matrix super trace. And what is a super trace of evolution operator? It's a path integral. It's a Feynman path integral. All the steps are like dogma. In physics, you follow them, and they make sense. Even this equals to the path integral. Path integral. Over exactly the tangent bundle of the loop space with the reverse parity. And now, we, then the key observation by Edward Witten, which was explained later by Atiyah, is that this path integral can be computed by analog of Dustrom and Heckman of Dustrom and Heckman formula for infinite dimensions. Exactly word by word, in fact, word by word. And then this computation involves localization, where localization is on a constant loops, and you get topological formula for the index using a hat genus. This precise computation, I think, was written by Alvarez Gomez, but this was Witten's idea that you simply generalize Atiyah bot, Dustrom and Heckman, to the loop space, and you get Atiyah Zinger as a simple computation. So that's the, and you do what is called, why you call it a path integral? Because it's an integral over this, over this infinite dimensional space. Actually, one can even, Bismuth defines this in some way, but, and so that's the classic part of the story. This can be generalized very far. We started with index. You can consider Dirac operator on a loop space and do similar things. That's, oh. So this is one part of the story. So we explained this. In a sense, I didn't explain this, although it's written in the references, because I realize once I start writing this down, we need like, we cannot finish here. So I just say words. If you like, I can write a nice formula for this, which makes perfect sense, but one needs to explain what it means. So let's write it just for fun. So path integral, this is integral. Let's use this symbol. You integrate over this space. Then you take e to the negative s. Then I write this as follows. Just let's write it explicitly. Basically, you use, you put some Riemannian metric here. Then you consider action functional in Riemannian geometry. X dot square, length squared, plus you take in a product, you have Fermi degrees of freedom, Grassmann variables psi, times covariant derivative x dot, this is levi civita connection, psi dt over dx, d psi. This is some so to say, integration measure in the infinite dimensional space. And this is precisely like H, this is like omega. That's exact. If you do it carefully, you will see that it localizes on a constant loops, x dot equals to zero. Why this is so? Because this is supersymmetric. This, you denote this by a single symbol, S of x and psi. This is called 
classical, this is action, action functional, the functional of a field, x and psi. x is a loop, psi is a vector field along that loop. And this is supersymmetric. The key is the following observation, that delta SE is zero, where delta, little delta, is defi was defined, is defined here. So, so this is the case where you don't have isolated fixed points anymore. Is that right, you don't have isolated, right, but they form a very small so to, sub variety. The formula would have right, the formula should be modified, yeah, but that's kind of... But you claim you get the end of the... Of the yes, uh, this was actually was done in many places, but first Alvarez Gomer kind of wrote it down, wrote it down long ago. Okay, so that's, that's the super trace. Now what about trace? What is trace of this operator, say? This, what is called in physics, is a partition function, z of beta. Then beta, positive parameter, has a meaning of the inverse temperature. Can we compute this? First, it looks no way, because this is a very complicated function of beta. Partition function admits phase transitions, thinks it changes behavior be below and above the critical temperature, and so on. It becomes very complicated. So there is no hope to compute this at all. And, but then you can ask, what about special cases? When you can you compute this in special cases? Beta goes to infinity, maybe? No, for all beta, no, for all beta. Beta goes to infinity is kind of trivial because you can expand. It's Laplace method. Beta goes to infinity is standard. We want for all beta. And we want to compute trace and matrix trace, to compare, because this is spectral trace. Trace. Now, what about if you try to do, so this is some operator in the Hilbert space. And then if you try to write it as a matrix trace, it will be path integral over usual commuting variables, which you don't know, which you don't know how to compute. But somehow, and this is the part which relates to Jacobi and Poisson, and I'll mention a couple of words about Selberg, there are three cases when you can generalize. The key idea is the following. So in many cases, index is zero, say on Lie groups, so on S1, on any Lie group, the analytic index, you, it's a spin, each group is a spin manifold, the index is zero. So this gives nothing. But still, on any Lie group, so let's consider, list the examples. First example, M is S1. And then, of course, it's a link group. It has an operator. It's just Laplace operator. Right. On L2. It's perfect trace. Then, what about example two? Then the example two, M is compact, semi-simple Lie group. It also has Laplace operator, semi-simple Lie group equipped with cartan killing matrix. Say. It has a Laplace operator of cartan killing matrix. It can be, this operator can be diagonalized using representation theory of compact Lie groups. Third example, when M is a quotient, when you take M is a quotient, G mod gamma mod K. G is non-compact. Semi simple Lie group. K is maximal compact, maximal compact. Gamma is discrete. 
gamma is discrete. And we can consider the then. Is this going to be finite volume k? Yes, of course. Even say the gamma is co compact, co compact, of course, yeah, yeah. Because finite volume is much more complicated. Co compact is much easier. So this also gamma. Cartan killing metric is pseudo Riemannian negative here, you quotient becomes positive. This has a nice nice Laplace operator. So in each of these cases we have Laplace operator. In particular you can think when gamma is SL2R K is SO2, then gamma is subgroup of here. This quotient becomes Lobachevsky plane, hyperbolic plane, and then you have the quotient is hyperbolic Riemann surface. That's the simplest instance of Selbeck trace formula. But true content of Selbeck trace formula is this. Because if you consider, say, G to be SL3, then the quotient G mod K is some crazy fifth dimensional manifold, real manifold. So, but the true meaning is you take this double cosets, double quotient, and that's where the harmonic analysis of Laplace operator gives some kind of trace formulas. Now, how to deal with this? How to embed this into supersymmetric localization, which we discussed here? It turns out that there is no way, it looks like. Because you see, if you consider how you can do, you remember we define the super, tra super trace is the difference of traces. Consider this operator, negative 1 to the f, just fancy notation. In this block form, it is 1 minus 1. This is precisely the operator, which is plus one here and minus one here. Then the super, and this is a fancy notation, it's a fermion number operator, but never mind, never mind. Then the super trace of this. Super trace of this. Oh can be written as an ordinary trace of this operator, which is a clear, which is a triviality. That's the super trace. Now you can consider trace. Now to explain why this, how this happened, you, you see Each of these examples requires modification of this action. So you see, this in a T singer case, this path integral is nice because this fermion path integral is never zero. All psi here matched from psi here. There is no what is called fermion zero mode. Because here, if you expand, you get product of psi matched by product of deep psi here. But in many cases, now let's do the following. Let's take the Lie group and replace, or even let's take the circle and replace this by dot by dot, time derivative. And there is no, and there is just one dimensional, no, it's just x dot square. And here you write, this is for m equals to s1, s1, psi, psi dot, dt, dt. Now, psi, is a periodic function on a circle, admits Fourier expansion, and the constant term is missing from the action. Therefore, Fermion path integral is automatically zero. 
this says this explains why the index is zero. Because and this is very deep. It's called zero mode. There is a zero modes are present. And therefore this path integral is zero. Because one mode here in the measure, all modes are present. Here one is missing. So how to ad adapt it? Well, just insert it here. Consider this path integral, psi of t dt, from 0 to beta. Right? That's the constant term. Then this path integral is not 0. But it's not supersymmetric anymore, because the e to the negative action is supersymmetric. This insertion is not. But the, what was explained in, in this papers is that you can add an extra term here, which is called a deformation. I'll just add it here. So let me write it nicely. So we have this. All this is correct. Then you add another integral. You add delta of integral 0 with some pa parameter negative lambda, 0 beta, delta of x double dot psi dot x, sorry, delta of x dot psi dot. Delta just on the, on the x. Yeah, delta applies to each. These are functions of t. Delta applies to each time step. So you add this. And then the claim is that this whole thing, now with this addition of higher derivatives terms, if you add the usual term for t is zinger, you get 0. Because higher derivatives term give you supersymmetric action again. And it will be, when lambda goes to infinity, it will be localizable. But now, when lambda goes to infinity, delta of x psi dot would be x double dot square plus, because delta negative. And then you, it will be localized, not on a constant loops, but on solution on geodesics, which is x double dot is 0. These are maps. These are classical motion on a circle. And everything localizes on this. If you compute corresponding path integrals, here you get Jacobi inversion formula for theta function. Jacobi inversion formula, which says something negative pi n square t n over z square root 1 over t summation negative pi n square over t. This is spectral trace. This is a computation of the path integral. It's a matrix trace. So you get supersymmetry, gives you non tree. So I'm writing t, this is beta. Let's put here beta. 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 So that's the idea in a nutshell. It says, using physics slang, it says you need to saturate all zero modes. And that's the way of saturating zero modes so that they are present here, but here there is no, they are not present. So that's one way. So we have five minutes. I'll explain what this example gives. Here this gives what is called Eskin trace formula, trace formula. This is 1964 about a derivation of this. 
when the spectral trace. Eskin trace formula is expression when you had the heat trace of the heat kernel or the heat kernel for on a Lie group, on a compact Lie group. You express it not in terms of the representation theory, but using the characteristic lattice. You have a maximal torus. Then the maximal torus is a quotient of corresponding abelian Lie algebra by a lattice. This is a canonical object. It's called characteristic lattice. And then you get a sum. Spectral trace is a sum over dominant weights. It's all irreducible representations. Matrix trace is a sum over characteristic lattice. That's Eskin trace formula. Here we need to use a sigma model. Sigma, supersymmetric sigma model with one important distinction. You replace levi chivita connection by a connection distortion, by a flat left invariant or right invariant connection. Then you get Eskin trace formula. Here, it's even more inv interesting, but rather involved. I just say, you used gauged, gauged sigma model. Just look. Here, you use sigma model on G mod gamma. But G mod gamma is not, it's kind of nice. But Laplace operator on G mod gamma is bad, because it has spectrum is not bounded below. Therefore, you use some, some tricks. But, you, but then to get mod k, you use gauging. You use gauge sigma model with k connection over a circle, over a circle S1. And then if you do, then the spectral trace would be the sum of the eigenvalues of the Laplace operator on a hyperbolic Riemann surface, say. And the matrix trace computed again by this type of Feynman path integral will give the sum over closed geodesics on a Riemann surface, the right-hand side of a trace formula. So that's kind of putting this in perspective. So this part from Atiyah Zinger was very clear. This I kind of explained, but so I, I refer to this. So at, at least I think I gave some idea why this is very powerful way of thinking. If you want to prove some theorem, I, it's not clear. But if, if you want to prove a formula, which is more powerful than a theorem, this is the way. Super, that's the power of supersymmetry, proving formulas against proving theorems. Even just discovering the formula. Even right, even, that's not a right, right. Discovering the formula, exactly. Discovering the formulas. Now, I'll stop here. You see, that's a very good question, actually. When you add st standard term would be you add delta of x dot psi. And this is precisely one form dual to a vector field in finite dimensional case. That's canonical. So this comes from a circle action. And this is a natural one form associated with the circle action. This is high degree, but if you add this, you get zero. This is some, I cannot say what this corresponds to. There is still a circle action, which is reflected by this. But it's called higher order deformation, because you add either a standard deformation or a higher order. In the finite dimensional case, there is no path integral. You see, path integral becomes when you have an operator. In finite dimensional case, you just get an ordinary integral. So this is this is because it's an action of a sigma model, which is quantum mechanics. Just 
simple quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, the evolution operator, its matrix elements, are given by a path integral. The trace of the evolution operator is when you identify points and integrate over them. It's integral over the loop space. So kernel of evolution operator is the integral over the path space connecting two points. The trace is the integral over the space of free loops. How do you know which axis you're to choose to work with, to derive formulas? You see, uh, you always start with some sigma model. And then you, for a J singer, you consider its supersymmetric version of a sigma model in using the condition that it's supersymmetric and has no zero modes. In this case, you also start with usual sigma model, but the extra fermion terms are different because they contain no zero modes. It's always sigma model of some kind. Any other questions? So in example three, you're, you're supposed to get the Selberg trace formula out of this? Yes. And is, is there any extra twist? And you sort of didn't really indicate. Yeah, I didn't indicate because you see it's kind of, you need, it's a lot of, actually anal not analysis, but some distribution theory involved. Because you cannot use Euclidean time. You use ordinary physical time. Therefore, all, all integrals are oscillatory type but still they understood in a sense of distribution. And then you analytically continue using a weak rotation to Euclidean time. But because you see, the difference is here the following. What is the heat kernel with the wrong sign? Heat kernel, if you take the Laplace operator and raise it into exponent with the wrong sign, it's a perfect self-adjoint operator, but unbound. And therefore, it has even on a compact manifold, it has a spectrum. But unbounded trace makes no sense, literally. But, and, but if you take, imagine, you take physical time, you get some distribution. You're looking at a Schrodinger type equation instead of? Yes, yeah, just, sh you, the heat equation becomes Schrodinger type equation. Just in, heat equation is Schrodinger equation in imaginary time, in Euclidean time. There are two types of times real and Euclidean, and both of them are useful. When you do the sigma model and you do the path integral, do you do it sort of using the normal procedure of ghosts, or do you have to do something different to no, You see, answer? we are using localization, because remember that I wrote that this term becomes dominant. And therefore, it kind of, when lambda goes to infinity, gives you kind of a delta function localized at all closed geodesics. And therefore, just you evaluate it cleanly. You don't do the path integral. You do the limit, lambda goes to infinity. 